Right now, a hearing on an executive order issued last November by President Bush, which restricts access to presidential records. Yesterday, the House Government Reform Committee heard testimony from a panel of four historians on the potential impact of the order. California Congressman Steve Horn chairs the hour and 40-minute hearing. A quorum being present, the uh, Committee on Government Reform will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses written and open statements be included in the record. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be in the uh, record. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that a binder of exhibits for this hearing be included in a record. Without objection, so ordered. Chairman Burton, unfortunately, is uh, unable to be here and ask that I chair this important hearing. And I'm reading now a statement of Chairman Dan Burton, April 11, 2002. Uh, the chairman says, quote, I regret that I'm unable to be present for this very important hearing. Unfortunately, there's a serious illness in my family, and I'm unable to be in Washington. As you are aware, I have strong feelings about archived presidential records and the ability of the American people to obtain access to these valuable resources. It is my belief that Executive Order 13233 is not appropriate. The President is doing a great job and he has my unconditional support. Unfortunately, he got some bad advice on this issue. This is not the first time I have said this. Last month, we were finally given access to documents that President Bush had claimed were subject to executive privilege. Those documents relate to law enforcement corruption in New England and goes back to 1960s and that has resulted in $2 billion of civil litigation. It was right for Congress to fight that fight, and I'm grateful that we were finally able to reach an accommodation. It is my hope that Congress will show similar diligence when it comes to correcting the excesses of Executive Order 13233. I urge my colleagues, Republicans and Democrats, to support the legislation introduced this afternoon by Representative Horn. I particularly want to thank Representative Horn for chairing today's hearing and for his and his staff's hard work on this issue." Unquote from the chairman of the Go Committee on Government Reform. Dan Burton. Today's hearing involves public access to the records of our former presidents. The Presidential Records Act of, uh, are you speaking for the, well, I'm going to wait until uh, the ranking member is here. If you want to. I don't think you'd mind if I gave an answer. Okay, go ahead. All right. Can you do it? Yeah. Here he comes. Okay. Uh, the ranking uh, member today is uh, the usual one, which is the ranking member from California, Mr. Waxman. And uh, I will uh, finish this one paragraph, and then you've got uh, a lot. Today's hearing involves public access to the records of our former presidents. The Presidential Records Act of 1978 declared for the first time that the official records of former presidents belong to the American people. The act gave the archivist of the United States custody of those records and imposed on the archivist, quote, an affirmative duty to make such records available to the public as rapidly and completely as possible consistent with the provisions of this act, unquote. Now I'm delighted to yield five minutes or whatever he needs there. Uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, the ranking member. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you for holding today's hearing.
and I want to thank this uh, distinguished panel of witnesses for appearing uh, at the hearing today. What's at stake is extraordinarily important, the public's right to know how its government operates. Unfortunately, the Bush administration is undermining the public's right to know and Congress's responsibility to oversee the, the administration. Vice President Cheney chaired a task force to develop the administration's energy policy. One year ago next week, Representative Dingell and I asked the General Accounting Office, the nonpartisan watchdog agency for the Congress, to find out who attended those task force meetings, who were the professional staff, who did the task force members meet with, and what costs were incurred in the process. The Vice President's office has refused to comply with that request, forcing the Controller General to go to court for the first time in the history of this country. Also one year ago, the Secretary of Commerce refused to release corrected census counts claiming they were deliberative documents. As a result, I and 15 of my colleagues from this committee were forced to go to court. The court granted summary judgment in our favor on January 18, 2002, and ordered Secretary Evans to turn over the adjusted census data. Despite the court order, the administration continues to resist releasing this information. In October 2001, Attorney General Ashcroft <coughs> issued guidance to agencies on implementing the Freedom of Information Act. The thrust of that guidance was, when you have discretion, use it to withhold documents. You can be assured that the Department of Justice will defend your decisions, wrote the Attorney General. The list goes on and on. One particular objectionable aspect of this secrecy campaign is the Bush executive order restricting access to presidential records, which is the subject of this hearing. In this executive order, the president tries to turn the law upside down, making it more difficult to get access to presidential records. The first victims of this attack are the historians who pour through thousands of pages of documents to piece together the story of what happened within past administrations. Our witnesses today can each speak to how important these records are and were to their work. Ultimately, however, the real victims are the American people who are denied their right to an open government. <coughs> there is a bipartisan consensus that the President's executive order was a serious mistake. And I'm very pleased that I'll be joining with Subcommittee Chairman Horn, Subcommittee Ranking Member Schakowsky, Full Committee Chairman Burton in introducing the Presidential Records Act amendments of 2002. This legislation will nullify the President's executive order and codify in statute procedures based on the Reagan executive order that are designed to expedite the release of presidential records. And I look forward to the testimony today, and I hope that my colleagues on this committee will join Representatives Horn, Schakowsky, Burton, and, and me in supporting our important open government legislation. Thank you. I thank the gentleman, and now uh, the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Maloney. Th th thank you very much. Uh, I, I feel very strongly uh, about this. It, it uh, really, really flies in, in the face of uh, everything we're doing. Currently, right now, I am in a markup of the Financial Services Committee, which is attempting to address the abuses in the Enron scandal. And one of the prime focuses is disclosure information, transparency. And what are we doing here but reversing this? Uh, presidential papers and other documents should not be kept secret. And elected officials have to remember we are public servants. We are elected. We are elected to serve. And our work belongs to the people of this country who either voted for us or didn't vote for us. And I feel that this is so important that we see a bipartisan leadership coming together uh, with my good friend, uh, Subcommittee Chairman Mr. Horn, who has championed many good causes, ranking uh, ran uh, the, the, the Chairman Burton. Uh, we have had many disagreements with uh, him, with the uh, ranking member Waxman and other members of the committee, but he joins us 
and, and, and uh, along with Ranking Member Schakowsky, with legislation to nullify or dissolve this uh, ill-conceived presidential order, 13233. And uh, I am extremely proud to be a, a co-sponsor of that. I would like to say that the leading opinion molders in this country agree, the Los Angeles Times uh, on this uh, action on November 1st uh, attacked, uh, they called it an attack on the principle of open government. They called it the dark oval office. The Washington Post called it a flawed approach on records. The USA uh, Today in their editorial called it self-serving secrecy. Bush seeks to thwart release of administration papers. And the New York Times called it cheating history. So I would like to request that all of these editorials, in support of the public's right to know, uh, that it be placed in the record. And I May thank you, Mr. Chairman. Order. And it is uh, often quoted that uh, Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandis uh, said, and it's as correct today as when he said it many years ago, and I quote, sunshine is the best disinfectant. And there is a public right to know, and as the people's representatives, we must never forget this fundamental right. I, I believe that uh, Ranking Member Waxman outlined some outrageous um, examples, uh, even with a court order to release the information on the census uh, that the current administration is, is thwarting that. This is information that the taxpayers paid for that they should have. And I, I regret that I am in a banking committee, uh, financial services committee markup on really basically this same point, transparency, the openness of information. I support this legislation, and uh, I, I appreciate very much the, the leadership of moving this to hearing forward. Thank you. Uh, I'm shocked uh, that you would go for financial matters rather than morality. So, uh, <laughs> but We're I trying to put the morality into financial matters. <laughs> We're putting morality <laughs> into financial matters, and and really the theme is disclosure, 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 transparency, and then to move and try to block records that belong to the people that was created with their tax dollars, I, th I find absolutely outrageous. And in fact, I think we should have two or three more hearings on it. Thank you. Bye-bye. You want to do them this afternoon? <laughs> okay. I now yield to the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Turney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for having this hearing, highlighting an area that we all think is extremely important. Thank you to all the witnesses for listening through all these opening statements uh, before we hear from you. And, and I'll say up front that I also have to leave, not to go to the Financial Committee, but to deal with uh, a hearing before the Ways and Means Committee on welfare reform. And I don't want to try to equate or rank one above the other. It's just that I have to be there. Uh, but what you've said and what you provided in your written remarks is certainly helpful and useful, and I thank you for that. And you can trust that uh, they'll be reviewed and taken to heart. Uh, we've got a serious problem with this administration, as I think you've heard from a number of people on both sides of the aisle, uh, with this proclivity towards secrecy, uh, toward keeping things under wraps, towards not sharing with the American public or even Congress uh, information and documents that ought to be made available and that would be very useful to the democratic process if they were made available. This morning, members of uh, this committee, in fact, received a so-called briefing from Homeland Security Director Tom Ridge. Uh, but unfortunately, this uh, briefing was somewhat less than that. It also was held behind closed doors when it should have been held in full public view. Uh, the committee was not seeking classified information from Governor Ridge, and there really was no reason uh, why he couldn't have subjected uh, himself uh, to the congressional questioning and to the public light uh, when we have such a serious issue as Homeland Security. Because of his vast responsibility on operational, budgetary, and planning functions, it should have been a formal hearing. Yet the administration, as in other matters, has stonewalled efforts to achieve that goal. We shouldn't necessarily be surprised, I guess, that the White House uh, is taking these actions. For more than a year, members of Congress and public interest groups have struggled to obtain from this White House documents related to its energy task force. And I think Mr. Waxman went into that in some detail, detail about how it took a lawsuit uh, just to get a small amount of documentation that should have been provided and as much more that should be released. They will confirm the worst fears of environmentalists, that when they were preparing the energy plans, the White House listened almost exclusively to energy groups and industry heavyweights and largely ignored the concerns of the environmental community. So it's no surprise, I guess, that the administration sought to hide the decision-making process. Uh, 
but at the same time, they've shown the administration's unwillingness to publicly disclose, disclose other important information, including meetings between administration officials and Enron executives. And in a memo to executive branch officials, attorney, the Attorney General stated his support for the rejection of freedom of information requests. And that's something I think is extraordinary and before his statement, unheard of. Even more egregiously in some senses is the administration's invocation of executive privilege over Justice Department documents that this committee sought for its efforts to uncover why several men were sent to prison in Massachusetts for more than 30 years when federal law enforcement officials knew of their innocence. It's an absolute disgrace uh, that the administration has claimed executive privilege and kept from the public light documents that would shed information on how we might make sure that something like that never happens again. When last November there was signing of the Executive Order 13223 was completed, the administration served notice that it would work hard to maintain secrecy over its White House documents, not only of this White House, but for past presidents. And it's surprising that he, this president would be even more concerned about past president's documentation than they appear to be. But it's simply wrong for him to assert authority over those documents if it's being done for political reasons. So I'm pleased that you've all come here today to share your perspective on this and your wealth of information and knowledge. I think you can certainly speak to the importance of access to presidential records. And this is just one area uh, that I join my colleagues in hoping uh, the administration will reverse its course and allow the public to access to information to which it's entitled. I want to thank you all for being here. Again, I apologize for my early exit, but I want you to really understand that what you provide here today is useful and helpful and very much appreciated. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The delegate from the District of Columbia want to file a statement as read or wit. Uh, I'd like to make a few remarks, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Okay. It, uh, it'll be I'll, about three or four minutes if we could. We need to get to the uh, Well, I, indeed, witnesses. I apologize that I'm going to make a few remarks because of the importance of this hearing. Uh, but I have another hearing simultaneously here and, and, and in the Senate. But I have stopped by this hearing. Uh, at, to say first, I'm pleased to be a co-sponsor of your bill, Mr. Chairman, to amend the Presidential Records Act and to commend you for having this panel come uh, to testify today. Um, perhaps all of us are students of history. My two degrees in history, I think, have been perhaps more important to me than my law degree. Uh, it is with some understanding of history that we should approach our daily tasks here, and we do not always get to do that, to have that understanding of history, of course, we turn to those who look deeply into the record. We're here talking not about current history, but about the current matters, but about the kind of understanding of the past that should inform any responsible legislature. It is time uh, that um, these matters were clarified as they can be clarified only through legislation. I think we will be all the wiser when we hear today's testimony. I apologize to today's witnesses for whom I have the most res profound respect. Uh, I assure them that I will be looking closely at their testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with a few more paragraphs, and then we'll get to the uh, members uh, looking at us in the well, we very distinct tone. Oh, do you want to make a statement? I'd like to. Yeah, great. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Appreciate it. Last November, President Bush tried to subvert the intent of Congress when it passed the Presidential Records Act. Today, we begin the process of undoing that subversion. I am pleased that we have worked together to produce a bipartisan bill that addresses public access to presidential records. The Presidential Records Act was passed by Congress in 1978 to assure that presidential records created at the expense of the public became available to the public 12 years after the president left office. This law was designed to inhibit the kind of secrecy and dirty tricks that characterized the Nixon re-election campaign. If officials know their acts will become a matter of public record in the future, Congress reasoned, they will alter their behavior today. If officials know their acts will become a matter of public record in the future, President Bush reasons, they won't speak honestly. I find that formulation troubling. 
What is it about the advice the president's advisors are putting forward that they don't want the public to know? Do the president and his advisors have conversations about Enron that would damage his reputation if they became public? Have his advisors told the president that his tax cut benefits uh, the wealthy while endangering Social Security Trust Fund? Are the president's advisors telling him that they have developed an energy policy that will fatten the wallets of his oil buddies in Texas? If so, I can understand why they would want to keep their advice secret. However, if the president's advisors are giving him their honest opinion about what is best for the country, I don't understand why they would want to hide. The opinion of the president's advisors is generally well known. The Bush executive order permits an incumbent president to block the release of papers from a former administration, even if that president has asked the papers be released. The B Bush executive order allows a former president to claim executive privilege to block the release of documents without any independent review of the legitimacy of that claim. The order even allows a former president's family to make this claim after the president's death. The Bush executive order is not about protecting state secrets or homeland security. Those concerns are already addressed in the law. Rather, this executive order allows the Bush administration to lock away documents that would reveal how Presidents Reagan and George H.W. Bush handled affairs in Afghanistan. This executive order can be used to make sure the rest of the Iran-Contra story is never told. The more the public knows about how its government works, the stronger the government and the safer our democracy. This attempt to undo the Presidential Records Act is one more act by this administration to close the curtain between the government and the public, an act Congress cannot allow to continue. Thank you. I'm going to uh, set the stage of this. The records of former President Reagan are the first to become subject to the Presidential Records Act. Near the end of his administration, President Reagan issued an executive order that established a process for former and incumbent presidents to review records before they are released to the public under the Act. The purpose of this review was to permit a former or incumbent president to claim executive privilege in the event he felt that a particular record should not be made public. Basically, the Reagan executive order provided for the release of records unless the former or incumbent president claimed executive privilege within 30 days after being notified by the archivist of the United States of the proposed release of those records. On November 1, 2001, President Bush replaced the Reagan order with a new order, Executive Order 113-233. This new order creates a much more restrictive process. For example, it gives both the former and incumbent president veto power over the release of records. It also provides an open-ended review process that permits either the former or incumbent president to prevent the release of records indefinitely, even without claiming executive privilege. Finally, the new order requires the archivist to automatically honor any claim of executive privilege by a former president, regardless of merit. Last November, the Subcommittee on Government Efficiency, Financial Management, and Intergovernmental Relations, which I chair, held a hearing on the implementation of the Presidential Records Act. Witnesses at our hearing <coughs> raised serious policy and legal concerns over the executive order 13233. Since the hearing, many historians, archivists, and others have written to me expressing similar concerns. Based on those concerns, I've drafted a bill that would replace Executive Order 13233 with a statutory process for reviewing records for possible claims of executive privilege. My bill preserves the constitutional right of a former or incumbent president to claim an executive privilege. However, Unlike the executive order, it does not so in a way that I believe is fully consistent with the letter and the spirit of the Presidential Records Act. I'm introducing my bill today. I'm pleased that a number of members have joined me as original co-sponsors of the bill, including Chairman Borton Burton and Ranking Committee Member Mr. Mo Axman and Subcommittee uh, Member, uh, the Ranking Member Mrs. Schakowsky.
the ranking member of the subcommittee. I believe that this bill represents a reasonable and fair solution to the problems created by the Executive Order 13233. I hope that the committee will consider the bill in the near future. At today's hearing, we will receive testimony from noted historians on the importance of access to presidential records and the impact of Executive Order 13233. I welcome today's witnesses and look forward to their testimony. Uh, gentlemen, the way this uh, committee functions, both the full committee and the subcommittee, uh, as an oversight committee, and therefore we ask all witnesses to take the oath, uh, and if you will stand and put your right hand up, and if you have anybody to support you, have them do it also. And do you solemnly swear the testimony you will give before the subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, the clerk will note that all four affirmed. And we will begin now, as the agenda has, with uh, Robert Dalek, uh, a very distinguished author and uh, of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, author of Lone Star Rising, Lyndon Johnson and His Times, 1908-1960, Franklin D. Roosevelt, an American Foreign Policy, 1932-1945, Hail to the Chief, the making and unmaking of American presidents. And uh, Mr. Dalek, I believe, is still at UCLA. No. You aren't? <laughs> okay. You mean you don't like our sunshine in California? <laughs> no, I, I retired and uh, oh, you did? seized one of these uh, Vera too, packages. I've been teaching at Boston University Go ahead. in years. <laughs> Well, Mr. Chairman, if, if you don't object, I would like to uh, defer to my colleague, uh, Professor Stanley Cutler, and let him lead off because, sir, he has been a driving force through the years in working to open presidential materials, and he was at the center of the struggle to uh, open the Richard Nixon tapes, and as perhaps just a symbolic expression of uh, deference, I'd like to ask him to speak first. Uh, Stanley Cutler is professor at the University of Wisconsin Law School, author of Abuse of Power, The New Nixon Tapes, and The Wars of Watergate. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I, I, I'm still younger, though, oh. I think. <laughs> well, I just want to, okay, you have the formal testimony. Let me just make a few remarks here. <clears throat> The 1978 Presidential Records Act uh, is one of those rare, exceptional moments in American legislative history when we get the compromise of competing ideas uh, that seems to work very, very well. There were those who said, as of 1978, that presidential papers, like all papers of public officials, belonged to the man or the woman, and they were theirs to deal with and dispose of as they saw fit. Uh, there were, those, uh, there were those who argued that, no, these are public records generated by public funds, and therefore the public should have access to, to them at some date certain. Well, between the advocates, of, or there were some who wanted immediate release, too. Uh, between the advocates on the two extremes, we sort of found a middle of this compromise of 12 years, of waiting till the president has left office for 12 years, and then uh, uh, we would have access to the papers. Uh, Twelve years seem to be reasonable and fair, and as I said, it seems to have, the idea seems to have uh, been relatively settled. But now suddenly, in 2001, the president's counselors have said no. Uh, one has been quoted as saying that, well, 12 years was not enough. And I asked at one point, well, 15 years, 20 years, 50, 100 years? And I had no answer, because I think uh, any is too many uh, in this man's mind. So uh, it, it seems to me that we're, we're now at a, a special moment in terms of whether or not we're going to retain this kind of openness uh, at a reasonable time. Uh, I'm a member of the, both the law and the history faculties, and I have taught constitutional and legal history for many more years than I care to remember. Uh, I am delighted that in this action today, what we're here for is that Congress seems to wish to assert itself in matters of le legislative prerogatives. 
from the most sophisticated course in constitutional law to elementary school uh, courses uh, in public school civics. The lesson is that Congress enacts laws, the presidents execute them. I have suggested in my formal testimony that President Bush has a special personal interest in closing presidential action, papers, an action that has nothing whatsoever to do with national security. It is hardly a secret at this point that the executive order had been in the making since January 21st, 2001, long before September 11th. President Bush's attempt uh, has resulted also, I think, in the most luxuriant interpretation of executive privilege I have ever encountered. Uh, Fair-minded fair and prominent people have fought over the parameters, the extent of executive privilege, and they will continue to do so, to be sure. But we now have extended these parameters, parameters in an extraordinary way. The president's heirs and designees can exert executive privilege from generation unto generation, it seems. And if that is not enough, the order conveniently extends to vice presidents, past and present. My understanding is that executive privilege lies with the incumbent office holder and does not follow him into retirement or to the grave and beyond. The effect of this presidential order, quite simply, is to overturn an act of Congress, an act that followed all the procedures as dictated by, by the Constitution. Uh, the act, the effect, the executive order has been to, uh, its effect has been to nullify the 1978 law and has brought us together here today in what I think is strictly a nonpartisan issue. We thank you for that statement, or are you complete? No, I'm through. Okay. <laughs> we'll now go back to Mr. Richard Reeves, the author of President Nixon, Alone in the White House, President Kennedy, Profile of sure. Power. Thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be an American citizen. The uh, fourth complaint against, the, against King George, I don't usually get that reaction, Am I okay now? Uh, in the Declaration of Independence, the fourth complaint against the King of England uh, and why we should break away reads, and I read, he has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. That was Thomas Jefferson in 1776. Uh, there have been, since that time, uh, first a closing and then an opening, somewhat by accident, I think, of, uh, of, of the public's right to know. On November 1st, when the President signed uh, Executive Order 13233, I sent him copies of my books on President Kennedy and President Nixon saying that I thought they might be worth a lot of money someday as an artifact, because if this law stands, books like this will never be written again. Uh, the, uh, the classification system and that has gone on over the years has touched the comic. I always thought that the best uh, classification I saw to keep from historians and then from the public uh, was a copy of Evergreen Magazine in the Kennedy Library uh, with an inscription from Brendan Behan. Uh, the Evergreen, if, uh, for those of us who remember, is considered something of a dirty book at the time, and apparently it was classified to keep it away. For 25 years, the United States government said it would not be in the interest of the people to read these words, to my launchman John Kennedy, best Brendan Behan. For 25 years, that was classified and kept. Uh, this is James Madison uh, writing in 1822. A popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a prologue to a farce or a tragedy, or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance, and a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power which knowledge gives. Now, not everyone agreed with that, including presidents. President Lincoln's papers, for instance, did not become public until 1949. Uh, the, to someone like me, and I think other people at this table, uh, 
Presidential papers, in fact, are self-protecting. First, the presidents and their governments have the right, the power to exclude most anything on the grounds of national security, on executive privilege, or personal privacy. And, in fact, there are too many papers, 44 million papers in the Nixon archives, 50 million in the Reagan archives, where I now work uh, in Simi Valley, uh, California, uh, so that it takes a great deal of time and a great deal of interviews and study to determine which papers you should uh, look for. The, and I think historians, and I'm a journalist really, a reporter, uh, understand the reason that some uh, papers have to be kept uh, secret for uh, political emb embarrassment and such. And also, presidential papers are a commodity. They are extremely valuable. Uh, and they can be sold, they can be used for various reasons. Uh, it's my opinion that our government works uh, on a series of deferred, on a system of deferred compensation. Uh, yes, the pay is not very good to be in the government, but uh, you get the money later. I'm told President Clinton made more than $15 million uh, last year. That was almost as much as George Stephanopoulos made. Uh, so the documents as private property uh, are very valuable uh, to a president. Uh, three of us here, uh, particularly Dr. Cutler, have worked on on the Nixon papers. And without seeing most of those papers, I think it's hard to understand even now what happened during the Nixon administration. And by that, I don't mean the scandals of Watergate as much as I mean a systematic uh, attempt to skirt the checks and balances of the United States Constitution. Uh, General Charles de Gaulle of France was a great uh, role model for President Nixon. Uh, he governed more or less by edict. But most of us here are old enough to realize that President Nixon's two great accomplishments, the opening to China, uh, which changed the, the politics, geopolitics of the world, and the taking the United States off the gold standard. He really was the godfather of globalization in some ways. What we tend to forget, and what historians have had to try to find out, is that both of those world-changing edicts from the President of the United States had never been considered in public in this country. The Congress was not considered, the people were not considered, the press were not considered. Only four men, uh, Nixon and Kissinger in the case of China, and Nixon and John Conley in the case of uh, the new economics of the time new. We learned of this when the president appeared on television and announced it as a fait accompli. Uh, it is only through searching the records that you can realize what it is that happened and what was actually so different about uh, that president. Uh, the, uh, and no matter what archival system is used, the families and the former aides will try to protect their reputation, which is what you would expect of them and you would expect of us uh, to try to, uh, to bring that into more objective uh, light. They were greatly influenced, the American presidents of our generation, by Winston Churchill, who once said, my task, my goal, is to make the history and then write it before anyone else does. That's one of the reasons Richard Nixon was, uh, was keeping uh, tapes. Uh, there is no doubt also that the world is changing and that we have to take into account uh, what will happen. Globalization uh, brought great benefits, I think, to the economy of the world, certainly to the economy of the United States. It also, as we learned to our regret, uh, made terror uh, global. And it also was in the process of making uh, law uh, international, more international than Americans generally like to see. I don't think that President uh, Bush wants to st sit in The Hague 20 years from now explaining why he signed a certain paper involving certain people in the Middle East. And I think that that is something that Congress should consider in terms of why this move is being made so strongly right now by the White House and to evaluate uh, 
those arguments within a, uh, within a new context. Uh, luckily for us, history has been changed by the greatest, uh, the great historian of the 20th century is the Xerox machine. Uh, it is now pretty hard to, uh, to hide records unless you go to great efforts, and these are the great efforts that we are, uh, we're seeing. It takes, I love what I do, and I know uh, that the people I'm lucky enough to sit here with uh, loathe their work. I mean, it is, going through the archives is like sloshing through the uh, muck and, and mud of a, of a mine and every once in a while stumbling on a diamond, every once in a while finding out, for instance, that John Kennedy knew of the uh, Berlin Wall plans before the wall was built. And he thought it would prevent a war. The communists had their problem, which was their best and brightest fleeing. We had our problems, that we had only 15,000 soldiers in uh, Berlin, and we could not defend either Berlin, Germany, or Europe without using nuclear weapons. And President Kennedy did not want to use nuclear weapons. The walls, Checkpoint Charlie, and all that uh, solved that. President Kennedy emphasized in both public and private that as long as occupation rights were honored, the, the fact that American officers could drive through East Berlin, uh, the United States had no objection to what the East Germans or the Russians did on their side of the border. That was not understood at the time because had Kennedy gotten up and announced that, I suspect there would have been an attempt to impeach him. But in fact, uh, it is what Pre uh, prevented a war, and as he said privately, better a wall than a war. Uh, no one knew that, and that is the job, I think, of historians to try to find out uh, what that meant. There are many ways now to avoid it, and, not, and it involves not only this act, it involves the system that Dr. Kissinger set up basically to hide his papers in the Library of Congress. And since I'm doing uh, a book now on President Reagan using his papers, uh, I would, uh, I'll close with just a, a note that I received, friendly note I received from the Library of Congress when I applied to uh, uh, look at the papers of Alexander Haig, who was after all the Secretary of State of the United States during that period, and once or so he said even ran the government. Uh, <coughs> This is what you get under the kind of legislation or the kind of process that the Bush administration has put in. I'll end with this. Dear Mr. Reeves, we have been notified that your request for permission to consult Alexander Haig's papers have been denied. Please let me know if we can be of any further assistance. <laughs> Thank you. Could you tell me who signed that letter? <laughs> it was signed by John Haynes, who is the uh, chief of the documentary section of the Library of Congress. <laughs> Did you try the Librarian of Congress? Uh, I haven't gone uh, there. It's funny, I was giving the Library of Congress a lecture that year. I didn't uh, bring it up. But the fact of the matter is he's going to say the same thing because uh, Kissinger and Haig figured out a way to hide their papers. Uh, not only from you and from us, uh, but from the National Archives. Well, an endowed chair has been uh, in the Congress uh, Library of uh, Mr. Kissinger's. They don't let us see that. <laughs> <laughs> we now have our last presenter, no, Mrs. We've, Hoff. <laughs> we've forgotten our, our first what? presenter. Oh, I thought he gave up. I only on deferred us. for the moment, <laughs> not permanently. <laughs> Okay, good to see Thank you, you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to uh, testify at this hearing about your proposed legislation nullifying President Bush's Executive Order 13223, revising procedures for release of presidential documents established under the Presidential Records Act of uh, 1978. As I understand matters, the executive order would give a sitting president, as well as past presidents, and their heirs, the power to withhold presidential documents for as long as they believe necessary. This control of historical papers would also extend to vice presidents. I read President Bush's executive order as essentially nullifying 
earlier legislation making presidential papers public rather than private property. And that, of course, has been a long struggle for historians to assure that these papers should be in the possession, so to speak, the ownership of the public rather than the presidents themselves. If Mr. Bush's order is left standing, I believe it will return us to the era when presidents owned and controlled access to the documentary record generated during their administrations. The committee's amendment to the Presidential Re Records Act would eliminate this return to a state of affairs the Congress ended in the 1970s. My work over the last 30 years in five presidential libraries, FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, and Johnson, for books on Presidents Roosevelt, Kennedy, and Johnson, leaves me unconvinced that President Bush's executive order, as the administration alleges, will contribute to a more orderly release of presidential documents particularly greater assurance against breaches of national security and of privacy rights. To the contrary, the President's directive will make the study and understanding of recent presidential history more difficult. It will undermine Justice Felix, uh, Frank, Felix Frankfurter's definition of democratic government, and I quote, as the government which accepts in the fullest sense responsibility to explain itself, unquote. Attorney General Ashcroft has asserted that the executive order was essential for protecting, quote, national security, enhancing the effectiveness of our law enforcement agencies, protecting sensitive business information, and not least preserving personal privacy, unquote. I find the Attorney General's statement unconvincing. The 1978 Presidential Records Act makes ample provision for the protection of both national security and personal privacy. More to the point, in my 30 years of work in presidential libraries, I have never heard of a breach of national security by premature release of presidential documents. Nor do I know of any notable violation of personal privacy by an unauthorized release of documents in the holdings of the libraries. Indeed, next year will be 40 years since the death of President Kennedy. And in the coming week, I'm going to have, I'm completing a biography of uh, President Kennedy. I'm going to have access to President Kennedy's medical records. I'll be the first biographer or historian to gain access to these materials. Uh, I shouldn't be the only one. This should have been available a long time ago so that we could have known a great deal more about President Kennedy's medical history. But better late than never, as they say. I will... Uh, leave it to others with greater expertise than I have to comment on the claims of executive privilege asserted by the President as an additional basis for his order of November 1. I can say, however, that to the best of my knowledge, it is unprecedented to claim that Presidents maintain executive privilege after they have left office. Nor will I speculate on what exactly motivated President Bush's executive order except to say that it is hard to believe that either national security or personal privacy are genuine central considerations. I would like to focus instead on the importance of opening presidential records to journalists and historians in a timely fashion. No one interested in the country's well-being favors inappropriate release of presidential materials. Some matters relating to national security and personal privacy should remain secret for the proper functioning of our government. As my colleague Arthur Schlesinger Jr. said in a letter to this committee last November, and I quote, a measure of secrecy is certainly essential to executive operations, but secrecy should be rigidly reserved for specific categories, weapons technology and deployment, diplomatic negotiations, intelligence methods and sources, personnel investigations, tax returns, personal data given the government on the presumption that it would be kept confidential. Secrecy, Schlesinger adds, carried too far, becomes a means by which the executive branch dissembles its purposes, buries its mistakes, manipulates its citizens, escapes its accountability, and maximizes its power." Unquote. Holding back presidential documents impoverishes our understanding of recent history and handicaps a president wrestling with difficult contemporary policy questions. The more presidents have known about past White House performance, the better they have been at making wise policy judgments.
President Franklin Roosevelt's close knowledge of President Wilson's missteps at the end of World War I were of considerable help to him in leading the country into and through the Second World War. Lyndon Johnson's effectiveness in passing so much great society legislation in 1965 and 66 partly rested on direct observation of how Roosevelt had managed relations with Congress. President Truman's problems in the Korean War following the move across the 38th parallel into North Korea was one element in persuading President George Bush not to invade Iraq in 1991. Every president uses history in deciding current actions. The principal victim of President Bush's directive will be himself and the country. The study and publication of our presidential history is no luxury or form of public entertainment. It is a vital element in assuring the best governance of our democracy. No one, no one has a monopoly on truth or wisdom in the making of public policy, nor can historians or history offer a foolproof blueprint on sensible courses of action. But it is a useful guide in helping an administration make decisions about domestic and foreign affairs. The more we know about our past, the better we will be able to chart a sensible future. Your amendment to the Presidential Records Act will serve the nation. Thank you for listening to my remarks. I'll be happy to answer any questions that could in any way be helpful to your additional deliberations. We thank you on that presentation. And our last presenter, and uh, we need to get, because uh, we're going to be called to the floor soon for votes, and I want to make sure Mrs. Hoff has a chance to uh, get her presentation in. You're certainly uh, welcome to uh, uh, sort of uh, give it a from the heart speech rather than all the you know single things because we don't have the time for it uh, frankly but uh, please give us a summary of your all of these things go in the record but uh, we'd like to see you what you want uh, on uh, what's the best way to make the best points given the time situation where everybody's yelling for the planes and uh, They've got pension legislation there, so everybody's around there. So Joan Hoff is director of Contemporary History Institute at Ohio University, former president of Organization of American Historians, former editor of the Presidential Studies Quarterly, author of the Nixon Considered the Nixon Presidency. We're glad to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to testify. In the capacity that I held as uh, head of some of these national organizations, I've long been concerned with access to presidential papers. I've worked in all of the presidential libraries myself, except for the Reagan Library, and uh, published primarily on Presidents Herbert Hoover and uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, to a degree, I kind of claim a monopoly on unpopular Republican Quaker presidents, <laughs> of whom we've had two. Uh, anyway, today, uh, I want to simply uh, reiterate what some of my colleagues have said, but also to place the Presidential Records Act of 1978 into historical perspective. It is one of the most important pieces of reform legislation passed in the aftermath of Watergate. Historians generally concur that Watergate was about holding top government officials accountable to people in a democratic system. The issue of government accountability is inextricably linked to access to information. Watergate aroused the historical profession, other scholars, and journalists to this important linkage, but that linkage remains fragile and needs to be constantly guarded. The 1978 Presidential Record Act provides this protection primarily, as you've heard, because it terminates private ownership of presidential papers and made those papers property of the federal government. But in November, President Bush, with his, pres his executive order, I think, stepped backward with respect to holding government officials accountable, the very issue that was at the heart of Watergate. Moreover, this executive order would appear, in, at least in my reading of it, to be incompatible with the 1978 statute by allowing a former or incumbent president to assert a laundry list of privileges beyond those recognized in the 78 law. It also places undue financial burden on academic researchers, a point that hasn't been raised here today, in particular to the degree that these researchers would have to retain counsel and sue for restricted documents without knowing what was in them. 
I don't think there's any point in second guessing why the Bush administration issued this executive order because that would bog us down in political speculation. But I think the simple fact, in my opinion, is that like the War Powers Act, Presidents in general are suspicious of the Presidential Records Act and of the Freedom of Information Act. Hence, each president since Nixon has devised slightly different ways for protecting secrecy, either through officially claiming executive privilege or calling it something else, such as presidential or constitutional privilege. But the President Bush, I think, has gone beyond all these previous attempts by presidents to operate in secret with this uh, executive order. If vigorously enforced, it would constitute an executive rewriting of two congressional statutes, the Presidential Records Act and the Freedom of Information Act. We talk about people's right to know, but more often than not, it is Congress that has to protect that right when the public isn't paying attention and demanding it. And that's why we're all here today, to consider Congressman Horn's proposed legislation. I've outlined on page three of my official report the segments of the executive order that disturbed me, but I want to reiterate one of them uh, in particular that I've already mentioned. In contrast to the 1978 Act, the burden of judicial proof is shifted to the researcher by this executive order who, at his or her expense, must show a demonstrated specific need when requesting restricted records. Research is already too expensive and time-consuming for most academics, especially graduate students, and this provision would simply discourage many of them from working in presidential papers. In general, it seems to me that in contrast to the PRA, which mandates that the archivist of the United States shall have an affirmative duty to make such records available to the public as rapidly and completely as possible, that this executive order, in order to carry it out, that is, the archivist of the United States would be put in the untenable position of having to violate the 1978 Act. Congressman Horn's bill rectifies most of my specific concerns. However, I still believe that it gives incumbent presidents too much unlimited authority over the release of papers of former presidents. The need for government accountability and access to information in our democracy hasn't changed, but the public doesn't always think it is important. We are in one of those times of public indifference because of September 11th. The Bush administration is taking advantage of legitimate public fear about national security to take steps to keep its activities secret, especially its decision-making activities, and has extended that secrecy in this executive order to the policy formulating processes of previous administrations. In doing so, I think the President and his aides and the Attorney General at least in their public statements, have set a dangerous tone and are sending the wrong message to government employees and to the American public. That message is frightening in its simplicity. Secrecy is more important than openness in government. Presidential tone is often more important than direct presidential action and less easy to contain. In this case, it is creating an atmosphere of hostility and suspicion that can permeate the minds of government officials and dull public awareness about the dangers of secrecy in a democracy such as ours. Lastly, I think it has been abundantly evident since Nixon that any administration which arrogantly asserts executive privilege to prevent public access to decision-making processes or to dodge accountability does not ingratiate itself with members of the media or scholars who usually become all the more determined to ferret out government secrets. The general historical rule of thumb is that presidents' reputations do not usually suffer as more of their papers are opened. Closed papers do not protect presidents in the long run, however tempting it may be to restrict them in the short run. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank you for that very helpful, practical uh, bit, and that goes to the other historians. If you take a look at the uh, measure we are putting in today, that's simply one step. And if you have some more ideas, let us know. We'd appreciate it. We now are going into the question period, and I'm going to start yielding myself five minutes and then the ranking uh, member. And uh, we have a number of people, and we'll simply alternate between both parties. Uh, the uh, right here, I was very interested in the uh, 
Yeah, I'm going to just ask a few fast questions because time is uh, takes going. And uh, I'd like to know how many of you uh, know that the First World War papers are still locked up. Why? Do we know why? It's like the <clears throat> First World War buildings that remained on We need the mic to. Oh, it's like the uh, buildings that were on Constitutional Avenue, on Constitution Avenue for years, from, dated from the First World War, that were called temporary. Right. For their furniture. No one knew why they were still there. My mother worked I, there in the Navy. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I know this about the First World War papers. I don't know. I don't know why anyone would be interested in trench warfare right now. Yeah. Well, I'll pass to another one now. Uh, as we drive in from Dulles every Saturday, we hear the Johnson tapes uh, brought from the Johnson papers. And uh, I take it somebody uh, is in with the people that run the Johnson library. And because apparently nobody else can get them, and now they'll release them. But it seemed to me, uh, to me uh, Dr. Dalek certainly, uh, when you were writing on Lyndon Johnson, yes. you wish you had those tapes. Well, I had a handful of them, but <clears throat> in fact, President Johnson directed that they should be closed for 50 years after his death, which meant that they would not be open until 2023. In her wisdom, Mrs. Johnson and the head of the Johnson Library, Harry Middleton, agreed that they would open them sooner. Indeed, as I think Joan Hoff said, uh, in essence, Johnson's reputation had nowhere to go but up. And by opening those papers, I think it served him, uh, served his reputation. And who can listen to them now, which I sometimes do, without a certain amount of amusement and uh, you're educated by them. But uh, uh, there are still many of those tapes that are open, uh, that are closed, indeed, at the uh, John Kennedy Library. Uh, which well, antedates... Well, let's stick with LBJ for a while. Uh, do you know what type, generically, of uh, phone calls are not being released? Well, they claim that what's held back are those materials which would jeopardize national security or violate personal privacy rights. Now, of course, I can never tell what, in fact, they've held back, whether it meets sensible uh, judgments on national security and personal privacy rights. Over my career, I've been mystified at times when I've seen papers that were released later, uh, and I wondered, why was this a national security consideration? It, it just mystified me. So well, those are the two criteria that uh, they're I using. Mean, uh, Dr. Uh, Kearns, I believe, is written on uh, Johnson. Isn't that correct? Yeah. And yes. then you're written on it. Mr. Yep. Caro has two volumes out in his uh, very fine effort there. Uh, he's got the third one now yes. on Johnson as majority leader. Yes. And that's coming out in a week, so, week or so. Yes. So I don't know who else is out there wanting it, but it just seemed to me that it ought to be open to everybody. Well, with that was, question. Uh, I, it was a, a, a piece of either historical or journalistic uh, entrepreneurship that uh, got to those papers. Basically, uh, one of our distinguished colleagues, uh, Michael Beschloss, uh, charmed, with the help of Simon Schuster, my publisher, uh, uh, Mrs. Johnson into releasing them by a certain date. This goes on in all libraries. Uh, the, uh, but one of the ways it was done was that Michael had access to them for months so that it was released to everybody on the same day, but he had a book finished that day, and everybody else was knocking on the front door. I think all of us have been in situations, mm -hmm. uh, if particularly at the Kennedy Library, where there are uh, researchers and then researchers, friends considered, Mrs. Kearns, Mrs. Goodwin, uh, considered a friend, uh, and that, and Arthur Schlesinger considered a friend, see different things. Most of, I don't know how other people feel about it. I would prefer a system where it truly was an equal starting line, but so far that has not happened. I have just one question and then I'll turn it over to Mr. Waxman. Are you aware of any instance in which the release of presidential records has created a personal hardship or otherwise resulted in public harm? Well, I, 
remarked on that in my uh, yeah. statement. I know of no instance. Yeah. And there have been a number of surveys done of former uh, officials of the government who when interviewed about whether it uh, put, uh, they felt inhibited in giving the president uh, advice because of the Presidential Records Act. All of them said no, and most of them said they couldn't even remember what were in the memos which were currently being restricted uh, in, that, in any given time period. So uh, that people who, who work for the government don't seem to think after the fact that this was an inhibiting factor. Any number of uh, incidents can be described, not necessarily with presidents that come to mind immediately here, uh, but uh, with materials that were released under Freedom of Information that have helped the individual enormously. Mm -hmm. For example, I was the first person to receive uh, the Justice Department records on the woman you know as Tokyo Rose, uh, Mrs. Tagori. Ms. Tagori. Uh, Ms. Tagori, uh, the government knew that perjury had been suborned in her case. The government knew that this was a uh, prosecution resulted from the relentless persecution by Walter Winchell and other reporters, that General MacArthur's staff, the FBI, had declined prosecution for four years. Now that all finally came out in all those materials. Uh, I, I think uh, Tokyo Rose got her, uh, as she's known, got her pardon from uh, President Ford in 1977, but clearly what she has now is a, is a pardon before the bar of history because she was no more guilty of treason than you or I were. The uh, victim of recent within the last couple of weeks uh, has been, uh, and I think in the cause of justice, uh, Dr. Kissinger. That is that the release of the transcripts of the conversations between the Americans and the Chinese that led to the 1972 uh, summit uh, revealed uh, something about the elegance and cleverness of Dr. Kissinger uh, as a historian. That is, in his description, uh, he said Taiwan was not a major issue in these talks. It was mentioned briefly at the beginning, and there was only a single mention, and that's it. The papers revealed it happened that I had had favoritism and had those papers before. Uh, the papers revealed that that was exactly true if you follow it word for word. The first thing said was by the Americans, by Dr. Kissinger, uh, look, Taiwan is yours, do whatever you want with it. There was no more, and with that, Joe and I said, okay, let's have a summit. Uh, but that was the single mention which made it so unimportant. And for the first time, Last week, Dr. Kissinger finally had to say, well, perhaps there were things uh, in his memoirs that he could have studied a bit closer to get a little closer to what actually happened. A clever man. Uh, thank you, and I now yield to the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank all of you for your testimony. I think it's been excellent, and uh, I've been admirers of all four of you and, and your work. It's, it's, uh, it's interesting when you look at this issue, there are really two losers. There's clearly the public's loss of information to which they have a right, and the other loser is the president himself or herself. Now, we should understand this is all happening at this moment with this president, and it only affects the Reagan administration and his pre and, uh, and President Bush's father, who was the vice president at the time. So the executive order is to try to keep the information about f former President Bush, when he was vice president, from being public, and also any records that will happen, uh, any records that would happen to come due to be released for both uh, the Reagan, Bush, and uh, uh, Clinton and Bush administrations as time may go on. Now, let, Ms. Ms. Hoff, you said one of the dangers to the public is dulling our senses about secrecy. Could you elaborate on that? Well, as I, in, I didn't uh, say it uh, in my opening uh, remarks, but it is in my, my formal uh, remarks, that especially in time of war, uh, government secrets tend to increase incrementally anyway. And I think what has happened since September 11th, uh, and then in conjunction with this executive order, is that national security has become a kind of mantra of the administration, 
and the public is being led to believe that everything uh, 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 can be uh, pr protected or kept secret in the name of national security. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, does have a kind of a dulling f effect on public opinion and the public's sense of what it needs to know in time of war. For example, if we had known uh, about uh, the terms of the secret negotiations that Henry Kissinger was carrying on with the North v Vietnamese before 1973, even six months or a year before 1973, I think you would have found that uh, that those uh, terms would have shown what historians later showed after they were able to get to some of these records, that the terms were no better than what the Nixon administration inherited in 1969 from the Johnson administration. Well, let me, let me turn to Mr. Reeves, because you're pointing out the dulling of our senses about secrecy, particularly at this time in our history where we have a war on terrorism. But Mr. Reeves, you talked about the balance of power, the uh, the checks and balances that's envisioned in our Constitution. How is that affected by this move toward uh, secrecy? The, uh, well, by withholding, that's uh, not so much in records. You can do it in retrospect if there are records. I, what the incident I spoke up with, with Nixon and there are others are basically the Congress not having any issue, because, uh, any uh, true information on well, the president the who wants doing. to keep information secret either about the past or the present is doing it, it seems to me for purposes of enhancing his power his power at the present time right. if the vice president of the united states doesn't have to reveal who he met with in an energy task force if uh, uh, we have these other examples where there's not the transparency in the way the decisions are made uh, and there's, there, the Congress is kept in the dark and the public is kept from knowing what's happening. It really keeps the, a check on the ability of a president uh, to, well, let me put it this way. It keeps, a ch it, it keeps the checks and balances from operating because the president starts getting more power because he can operate without the Congress and the public saying, no, wait, you, you may be going too far. Right. Well, that was the effect in those two cases, and I'm sure has been uh, in others. And if we believe in democracy, we essentially believe that the more people who are involved in a national decision, the better decision that will be. Uh, presidents routinely, I think, try to subvert that idea. They think they know better. Well, I, I suppose it's whenever, whenever you have power, you want more power. I'd submit that, that a president is uh, becomes the victim, not only the ways you all pointed out in your testimony, by the secrecy of these records, uh, but I think the president becomes a victim because when a president gets too much power, when anybody gets too much power, as the aphorism is, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, the president uh, doesn't have the usual checks on him that will help make decisions properly. And I, I thought it was an excellent point that you made, where if a president doesn't know history in making decisions at the present, he uh, could uh, repeat the mistakes or fail to learn from previous uh, mistakes. And I, I, I would submit that that uh, becomes a disservice to the president in making decisions not to have the advantage of information from the past and also to have too much power without the usual checks that democracy uh, would bring on that power. I know my time is up, but you, you've all made an excellent uh, presentation and I think a compelling reason why we ought to pass the legislation to uh, prevent this president from taking a law that uh, said the public has a right to this pre these presidential uh, papers and turning it on its head and trying to deny the public and his history uh, the benefit of, uh, of those papers. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman, and uh, we now yield uh, for questions uh, the uh, distinguished uh, member on this committee, Mr. Gilman, from the gentleman from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I certainly want to welcome our panelists today and thank them for their very astute analysis of where we are on presidential executive orders. Uh, as you probably are aware, this committee had been trying to get some information on the criminal background and the FBI uh, 
association with mafia, mafia cases in the Boston area. Um, let me ask, would the executive uh, privilege apply to anything before the Reagan administration? And uh, could it be utilized as a basis for restricting our access to information prior to the Reagan administration? Well, my reading of the law is, and I'm not a lawyer, that it would not. You know, Mr. Gilman, uh, executive privilege goes way back in our history, and presidents had or claimed executive privilege in relation to their principal aides. But it was only in the 1950s that we first began to have this broader approach to the whole idea of executive privilege, and claims were made that any kind of document that was generated in the executive branch could come un under this rubric of uh, executive privilege. But I do not know of a single instance in which executive privilege applies to past presidents, to uh, historical records. My understanding is that executive privilege, so to speak, expires with the president's term. Now, my, my colleague, uh, Professor Cutler, I think, knows more about this than I do, but that's my, my impression of uh, executive privilege. We, any we other... just never recognize, as far as I know, uh, I know no legal precedents that have recognized executive privilege lingering one day beyond a president's term of office. You asked before if any particular president before Reagan would declare that. Well, the only president, I hope I'm right here, that's alive before Reagan right now is Jimmy Carter. Am I missing somebody? Ford. Jimmy Carter. Ford. Ford. Uh, oh, Ford. Ford, that's right. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, well, they're the only presidents who are alive before uh, Reagan now. And uh, I, I don't see either one of them uh, have, as ever having exerted executive privilege from the day they've left office. And I, I wouldn't expect them to begin that uh, now. And that's what's so extraordinary about this order, the way this, this seems to perpetuate this, as I say, beyond the president's term of office, into his retirement, and then upon his heirs and designees. Uh, that's extraordinary, it seems to me. And, incidentally, to former vice presidents. In your opinion, if this were tested in the court, do you think it would survive? I don't think so. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, there are members of the district, uh, D.C. Uh, Court of Appeals uh, who uh, have uh, very strong conservative credentials who have ruled precisely against this kind of thing in the past. I'm thinking of uh, uh, Justice uh, Silberman, who has spoken out on this uh, in the past. And uh, uh, I, I just can't see this surviving a, a, a challenge. But it seems to me that uh, it's right here in Congress to assert its proper legislative prerogatives on this matter and, and reassert what was, assert, was uh, stated here in 1978. I mean, ideally, as a student of these things, that's what I'd really like to see, and stay out of court. Well, then let me ask the panel, should Executive Order 13233 be rescinded? Yes, definitely. Well, it would be unanimous at this table. Yes. 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 Unanimous well, I, I'm, decision? I'm not, sure. I'm not sure. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find any serious historian who would want to sustain it. I, I know of no one. And one other uh, thought. Should the act be amended to provide a statutory process for consideration of potential executive privilege claims? You mean beyond the 1978 act? Yes. Well, as I remember well, the uh, Nixon versus GSA, General mm -hmm. Services Administration, the Supreme Court held that a former president can claim executive privilege. And we're going to put that in the, without objection, into the hearing record and put the whole case in to, so everybody can look and mm -hmm. see. But that, that decision also said that executive privilege erodes over time. Mm -hmm. And consequently, it, it, it reaches a point of diminishing returns uh, according to that decision. And there, there is nothing said in that opinion also that implies that incumbent executive, uh, executive branch officials must honor that claim. What is so extraordinary here is that, uh, talk about putting things on its head, uh, the present order that exists uh, today provides that if there is any claim of executive privilege, uh, 
uh, that if uh, upon a claim of executive privilege, anyone were to challenge that, such as a, a historian or a journalist and so forth, that the President and the Department of Justice shall defend the claim. So in other words, former presidents don't have the expense uh, of going to court. Now, we all know that Richard Nixon wrote book after book in order to maintain that lawyer habit. Uh, but now this is put on its head, and the government of the United States will continue to defend former presidents in the exertion of that privilege. Putting researchers then in the position of using their money to bring suit against a former president who is being, whose suit is being financed by the government. It's a tremendous disincentive uh, <clears throat> to people who do this for a living because it's very rare to find anybody who can afford a lawyer uh, in the historic community to sell a house, much less take on the U.S. government. <laughs> So should, uh, and what is your answer? Should the act be amended then to provide a statutory process for consideration of potential executive privilege claims? I, I can't answer that. It takes, that's a very large step, it seems to me. Well, I, myself, I, I would just prefer that the language in the current executive order relating to the extension of executive privilege, privilege just be rendered null and void. That's all. Yes. And that would be the simplest way, it seems to be. And that the claim of an incumbent to block opening, for example, of the papers of a former president should, uh, should be very definitely limited, either to a time period uh, or at least to review by the archivist of the United States. I mean, under, under the statute or, or under this executive order, as I understand it, a, a sitting president can override what a past president decides to do about opening his papers. And an incumbent president can say, uh, uh, yes, Mr. Reagan or uh, Mr. Carter has said they can open these papers, but I am not going to permit that. And I, I find that uh, mind-boggling. What, what we have here is, is the concurred veto. Uh, which we all know about in terms of 19th century American history that Calhoun proposed that if one section didn't like what the other section liked, you know, it was null and void. Well, uh, President Carter, uh, President Reagan, President uh, J uh, George H.W. Bush can want to release something, but the incumbent can say, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so much for control over one's own papers. And that's actually happened in this last 14 months when the Reagan Library was prepared to open 68,000 Reagan documents, which were no longer restricted under the 1978 Act, and the Bush administration delayed that opening three times. And, and yet, when we saw what was opened, there was no need, there was no national security. There might have been embarrassment in terms of some of the advice the president was receiving about appointments, personnel matters, but embarrassment is not national security. Mr. Right. Chairman, on this issue. Oh, well, I, I want to thank our panelists for your analysis. The Q&A to the distinguished uh, new member of the House from California, uh, Diane um, Watson. Mr. Chairman, may I uh, yeah. uh, insert in the record an opening statement? Yes, uh, was it it'll be uh, put chairman. in at the beginning thank as you. if thank read. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, chairman, as I understand, there is a bill ready to be introduced uh, by Waxman uh, it's, Burton. It's my bill. It's, it's your bill. You're, it's welcome of you to yes, be Yes, I just wanted to know, okay. would this solve the problem? And do you know of the bill, the chairperson's bill, yeah. Dr. Mm -hmm. Horn? I think it gets to the points that you're raising. I would hope that you would elaborate on it, Mr. Chair. Well, as I am like we have uh, three or four members that uh, want to question, and we have a uh, vote, and so we're going to have to take a uh, recess, uh, if you can stay, and uh, we will uh, go vote, and uh, when uh, we end the recess, uh, which will be about 15 minutes to be over and back, and uh, that will uh, be, we will have chaired Mr. Osi, distinguished member of our committee and the chairman of regulatory affairs. We are in recess. Fast Eddie.
He wants to be somebody uh, more than what he is now. Yeah. I'm going to reconvene this meeting. I want to thank the witnesses for hanging with us. Apologize for the delay. I'll claim the time. There being no other members. First of all, uh, for each of you, for each of you, anybody who has any input on this, uh, of the 68,000 documents withheld for over a year, all but 150 pages have now been uh, released under the new order. Doesn't that sort of mute the criticism that you're registering on the new order, Mr. Cutler? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, first of all, have you, uh, I assume you've seen the list of what was withheld. The papers, there is a list. All right. Uh, it's a very promising list because it's, it's filled with, it, it, it promises to reveal internal debates over appointments and so forth, which is really, you know, in our understanding of how you make appointments and so forth is, is very, very important. Uh, there are people, uh, for example, Clarence Thomas, uh, that are mentioned in this, uh, that uh, obviously there's concern about uh, protecting him. But I, I don't think it changes anything. I mean, uh, it's clear that none of this is stated on the basis of uh, national security. That's, th th that, that was the first thing that struck me. This was all on the basis of uh, confidential advice. So. Uh, you know, I, I take it back for one second to the uh, Nixon stuff. When the first great release occurred in April of 1987, 150,000 pages were withheld, and we were given a list of everything that was withheld at the time. And it was it was the strangest thing. It was I mean there were things that about uh, Mrs. Uh, 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 President Nixon's remarks to the Davis Cup team. Uh, Mrs. Nixon's garden party and so forth, you know, which is strange. Why withhold that? But then, as you ran further down the list, there was, for example, H.R. Uh, Haldeman's file on the 1972 presidential campaign. Well, the 1972 presidential campaign uh, clearly involved the Watergate matter in some significant ways, but the whole file was withheld on the basis of personal political uh, Personal political, was that Personal it? Yeah. political yeah. was the standard. Which, the stand you know, only, uh, so, you know, the material was, seemed to be very, very significant. And that seems so here. So I don't, I don't think that moots the matter at all. Do you think say, say it seems significant? This new material. This the material, new material? Yes. Yeah. What I've looked at, I would say that I thought that it kind of uh, was not mitigating because uh, the material not that I've seen every page of it, but I've seen a lot of pages of it, uh, was not was barely questionable to be withheld. The, the 150 pages that are still not uh, let go are, base, are some sort of internal papers on judges, potential judges and whatnot, and they undoubtedly have, if they're candid, they undoubtedly have some things which might be uh, uh, private. But the rest of the stuff, uh, doesn't seem to me to rise to any test of, uh, of needing to be reviewed because uh, in, in the first case, the president saw almost none of this. These are internal memos between people uh, within the White House so that it was, it may have evolved into uh, advice to the president, but it isn't in those pages. The president is barely in those pages. What's the but what I find troubling about it is that one is gratified that so much of the material has now been released and there are only some 150 pages that remain. But I think it's the principle that's at stake here. Are we going to have to fight and scrap every inch of the way in order to get materials open and then two years, three years later, the White House concedes, fine, we'll open 90 percent of it. See, I mean, I think that the shoe needs to be on the other foot. We she looks like 99.8 percent. Uh, right. But, so. but we had to battle to get this, yeah. so to speak. And th these postponements can be become important uh, in terms right. of your own personal research and in terms of the, the issue involved. Uh, and I think that should be taken into consideration, uh, especially when the postponement turned out to have really no basis in reality with respect to either privacy or policy or national security. Let me, let me, let me if I might, then just kind of go back up the chain. 
on this particular issue and ask the question, was the Reagan executive order adequate or sufficient to protect the claims of privilege by former presidents? As a non-lawyer, my opinion of that was when he issued it uh, at the very end of his second term that it did perhaps open a kind of can of worms with respect to former presidents making claims of executive privilege long after they're out of office. Uh, and s since that wasn't challenged, or in, in this case codified till now, I don't think I gave it much thought other than it seemed to me to open a door that perhaps would cause uh, a former president long out of office to decide that somehow uh, his papers, uh, some papers reflected a need to be protected by a, a claim of national security when he, he may, might not be basically informed, well informed about what national security was 12 years later. If I can I read an example of what uh, the, the point I uh, hope to make about whether this uh, stuff was that sensitive at all. This is a 1980, this is one of the things that was just released. It's a 1987 memo from to Howard Baker, who was then chief of staff, uh, from Gary Bauer, and it was about, as we recall, the stock market crash of, of 1987, that dive. And this is what they felt they had to review to see if it uh, involved national security when it had been once passed already. It is not sufficient for the president. This doesn't go to the president. It only goes to Baker. It is, and the president hasn't seen it, at least since his initials aren't on it, and they usually are. Uh, it is not sufficient for the president to only say that this is not 1929 and the economy is good. I have attached President Hoover's statement after the October crash. You'll note that's exactly what he, what Reagan said. We do not need to give the press and liberals another, quote, parallel to draw between then and now. The Democrats are on the floor now making the Hoover-Reagan connection. Uh, we must move quickly, underlined, before the connection gets settled in the mind of the average citizen. Uh, I would argue that doesn't fit any of the, uh, uh, of the criteria uh, for papers that uh, should not be released. That existed under the Reagan executive order or under the new order? Under the, under the new. Okay. Mr. Ballack, anything to offer? No. Nope. Or, or there was, it wouldn't also have been restricted under the 78 Act? Right. Could have been. This, this piece could have been. No, I'm uh, saying it couldn't have been. Right. If, if that act were applied uh, uh, even handedly, no, it couldn't have been. All right. Finally, uh, if I might, this is my final question, and that is, do you think a statutory procedure that, di that directs how an incumbent president shall invoke executive privilege intrudes too much on presidential prerogatives? In other words, if Congress says you have to follow this process to invoke it, is that too much of an intrusion from the legislative branch into the executive branch? You mean on, on past? On, on executive privilege claims. About? past presidential materials, not current executive okay, privilege. Okay, past, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you mean, uh, uh, okay, to answer your question, no, I don't think so. I, I, don't, I don't think that would be any intrusion whatsoever. I think, I, I, again, I, I think that uh, this involves extending the executive privilege argument far beyond the confines of the, of the incumbent administration, whichever, whoever it is. So I, I don't see uh, uh, why that's an how in any way that's an intrusion upon the president's power. Uh, if if the, the former president has no objection uh, to it, uh, now you could say, well, the former president uh, may not know and may not appreciate the state of national security uh, at that at this moment. I find that hard to believe because. Uh, I'm assuming that past practice continues to this very day where former presidents are regularly briefed if they want to be by uh, the CIA and whoever uh, you know whoever does uh, the briefing I mean that's been the practice for about the last uh, uh, 40 years I think it goes back to uh, when Eisenhower became president and did this with Truman and succeeding presidents have done the same thing so it's, it seems to me unlikely that a former president would have no appreciation of what is a national security matter today. Was that responsive to your question? If, I, if, I, I mean, I understood the question differently oh, and, in fact, would take a different side. Okay. 
that is, since executive privilege is all is uh, often a contest between the executive and legislative branch, it would be an intrusion for the legislative branch to be able to set the set firm rules as but the to the executive, what involved. The executive it. could certainly veto any such legislation. Yes. Yes. No. I think it should be an ongoing uh, negotiation, which in, which could include vetoes or anything else. But I don't. I don't. Let, I don't think that. Uh, the law or anybody else would be helped if the Congress were, had the power, if they could sustain the power to define what executive privilege is, if I understood the question. Well, executive well, privilege is, is a doctrine that emerges by deduction. It's not out of the Constitution. Right. It's not out of statute. Mm -hmm. It's not out of anything. You know, it's something that, that comes up from time to time, and feelings toward it are governed by the exigencies of the moment. Uh, now, if you were to do this in a statutory sense, as you, you are proposing, I'm sure that the president uh, would, with your cooperation, your consent, uh, continue to exert executive privilege in certain other matters. You're saying that this is one we find not, no constitutional, no statutory uh, or logical authority for. That's all. Yeah, so, yeah, as long as the legislation applies to presidential papers, and as long as, if I'm reading it correctly, it does specifically indicate that there will be a time limit on the, both the former president's claims to privilege and the incumbent president's claims to privilege, that this can't go on indefinitely. That was, I think, a defect of the Reagan uh, order or a flaw in the Reagan executive order that it did not place a time limit on these claims of either the privacy or national security with respect to former presidents and presidents. The time limit, I think, is essential. And I don't think that would constitute an unnecessary congressional uh, invasion of, of presidential prerogative. Which you do well in this, this, this legislation, the time limit. No, it's been, yeah. I think it's very reasonable, very fair. As I, as I understand it, executive privilege is in the service of the effective functioning of the presidency. And I think if you are trying to extend executive privilege to past presidential materials, I don't see the logic of it. What I understand is that you want to defend national security against intrusion. You want to defend privacy rights against intrusion. But I'm hard pressed to understand why executive privilege claims would still operate in relation to past presidential activity. That individual is no longer president of the United States. His functioning as president is no longer going to be, because I assume that you're talking about quite specific things. You're not talking about some general principle as to uh, the functioning of the presidency, but quite specific instances in which the president is eager to maintain uh, control of information of his uh, communications between himself and uh, particular aides. And so I, I find extending executive privilege to uh, past presidential materials is something that uh, I'm not very sympathetic to or sympathetic to at all. Do any of you have any comments or suggestions on our bill to amend the Presidential Records Act beyond what's already been covered in your testimony, both written and oral? Mr. Cutler. Yes, I, I, I have one. That We're going to open the door for you here. Uh, just, just, no, no, just <laughs> Don't leave this little, room and say we didn't give you a chance. One little here. one. One little one, Congressman. I, I'm not clear this is uh, stated in the proposed bill, but one of the most disturbing things to me, because I've been through this, is the idea that the former president will be extended uh, legal counsel by the Department of Justice. It's not a very level f playing field. No. In terms of financing the cost of any litigation. Pardon me? In yeah. terms of paying the cost of any right. litigation. Right. And that is new in this executive order. That is new. Uh, that was proposed. And I would hope that that would be removed uh, or specific, specifically opposed, uh, okay. however you want to do it. But I really think that there is a, a level playing field that's at stake in this. Right. Anybody else? I thought the current legislation does that, though, doesn't the proposed legislation? I'm not sure. The current executive order no, the extends current, the, the proposed extends foreign the legislation. Financial. 
I don't believe the Horn legislation includes the financing of right. defense. The, that I'm it's being whispered in my ear ever so eloquently that the Horn legislation would, in effect, repeal the executive order and thereby remove the remove financial yes. uh, protection. And it would also then remove the uh, uh, necessity for the researcher to go to court to sue yeah, for correct. these records. Yes. Well, if that's if it's if that if the overturning of the order does that, then fine. Okay. Those are the two key provisions, I think, with respect to the average researcher. That, that the reversal of the burden of proof uh, simply would kill historical research for all intents and purposes because we normally, as researchers, don't have financial backing to uh, bring suit. All right. I think that concludes our hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for joining us today. Appreciate you all taking the time. It's been very informative. I know Chairman Horn is intent on pursuing this, as are many of his colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Your comments and insights will be incorporated into our deliberation. We thank you for coming. We're adjourned. Where are you going? Uh, I am going home to uh, meet my wife, I hope, coming in from New York. Well, I'm going, you, so you're going up? I'm going up.